So I have a confession that won't come as any surprise to you hurly burlyites who watch our pod on YouTube. There is no broadband internet where I normally am in rural Quebec in the Gatineau's. My download speeds are Scott Reed jogging in spandex slow. Uploading is worse. I mean, I know I'm jittery in real life, but not that jittery. That's why the recent federal government announcement of a $1.75 billion universal broadband fund to bring high-speed internet to rural and remote communities is so fantastic. And very welcome news for our presenting sponsor, TELUS. Bridging the digital divide has long been a key priority for TELUS. Over the years, they've invested nearly $200 billion in network infrastructure, operations, and spectrum. That includes connecting over 800,000 rural and remote Canadians in 110 communities and 55 First Nations. Their service has been independently verified as the fastest broad rural broadband in Canada. But there's a hell of a lot more heavy lifting to do. Over the next five years, TELUS is planning to connect an additional 3.5 million rural Canadians over almost 600,000 square kilometers. There can be roadblocks and red tape and, yup, delays. To get this done, it takes the committed partnership of all governments, federal, provincial, and Indigenous, plus leading private companies. TELUS is committed to building those relationships so that 100% of rural Canadians, even rider-loving podcasters in Denholm, Quebec, can download, upload, and digitally access every opportunity through a world-class network. Go to connectingcanadaforgood.ca to learn more. All right, Hurley Burleyites, we've got a special pod for you today. It's a one-parter, and this has become sort of an annual tradition with us, our political year in review. Our Annis Hurley Belis with the political panel, Scott Reed and Jenny Byrne. I say sort of an annual tradition because we did it two years ago, missed it last year, and now I'm deciding that was foolish, so we're bringing it back. This was recorded last night, Monday, December the 7th, as part of a virtual event held by our good friends at CJPAC. Scott and Jenny and I cover everything from COVID to CERB, to Trudeau missing his election call and John Horgan nailing his election call, to Jason Kenney, Anime Paul, and Aaron O'Toole, with a little bit of Peter McKay's flame out thrown in there just for fun. We also took a bunch of burning questions from our listeners and stay tuned right to the end if you need a good hardware or chicken wing recommendation. All in all, it's a great conversation and we hope you enjoy it. We're going to recap the events, the big events of 2020 and look back on them with hindsight. It was, as far as I'm concerned, an Annis Hurley Belis. Um, but uh, some people had a good year, I guess. But I'm looking forward to 2021. In any event, there were a few big things that happened, and let's talk about them. The first thing that happened, because it really started in in 2019, is the conservative leadership and uh, Aaron O'Toole's victory in the in the conservative leadership. You know, when that race started, it was supposed to be easily won by Peter McKay. Was he ever the front runner? I think he was at the start. Uh, obviously, I think that COVID uh, COVID changed uh, how the the whole race was structured. It obviously uh, prolonged it. And if you remember back when the party uh, uh, when the party postponed the leadership race, it was McKay's campaign that was uh, probably the most vocal on saying that it should uh, should go forward. So I think that yes, when the race started on day one, uh, Peter was the uh, front runner. Right. Scott, where did it go wrong for him? Oh, probably right around birth. I, like I. <laughs> I, that sounds like a jerky thing, but it's really your answer, David. I and mean, I thought that Peter McKay was going to win. I don't know anything about the ins and outs and the specifics of conservative leaderships. But when this thing started, I said, well, Peter McKay will win because he's the front runner and because people want the unsheer and he will feel like a safe destination and all those kinds of things. And you, David, to be fair, said he's a shit candidate. And shit candidates lose. And as Jenny says, COVID made the race longer, which if you're a shit candidate, you want a short race, right? You want less time to show your shit. And, um, you know, Peter McKay's well, a great guy. He's a nice guy, but he was a bad candidate. And I think he got ate up over time by just being a bad candidate. Well, front runners want a, want a, 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 a short race, regardless if they're shitty or not. That's right. But if you're shitty and you're Generally. a front runner, short is best. 
Jenny, one of the advantages of being a front runner is normally you have a huge organizational advantage because people want to be with the winner and you look like you're going to do well. And so a lot of the best organizers in the country want to be with you. Did that not happen for McKay? Well, I think I think COVID did change the dynamic of uh, the dynamic of this race um, uh, just because of the uh, of the length. Um, as well as you saw front, you saw it. Uh, so, so Aaron uh, ran a very steady campaign. Uh, uh, none of the leadership candidates were getting much of the traditional media coverage. They weren't doing the traditional events. There weren't coffee parties. There weren't rallies. There weren't uh, there weren't events. And so, uh, obviously, Aaron's campaign, uh, led by uh, by Fred Delory, uh, a former colleague and good friend of mine. Um, uh, was able to adapt uh, from uh, when, you know, the world went into lockdown on March 16th or 17th, uh, they were able to adapt and uh, uh, navigate the waters uh, better than the other campaigns. Don't you think that right. the one Let's, member, me... one vote system, it helps the, and I'm picking up on something you said a second ago, Jenny, like it, the one member, one vote reality of leaderships, particularly the conservative, because then they, they kind of have this, you know, by riding point system, but yeah, the overall is. the general one person, one vote system, it really advantages the insurgent candidates. Like it's harder and harder, you know, an old timey convention where there was lots of blue haze from cigar smoke and people would meet at four in the morning and cut a deal and hardy hard their way to a victory. Those days are over. It's way harder for a front runner to consolidate support. It's much easier for an insurgent uh, to generate momentum, I just, you know, it uh, it it really undermines the role that caucus, that power brokers and parties have, and it just it it hollows out all the old losers like us. You got to be a hustle, 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 sign them up person. Uh, uh, I've actually never worked on a delegated leadership convention. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank oh you for my making God, David you and I. Them. They were fun. <laughs> they <laughs> were all, the best. They were great. Yeah. We Mark's are old. Risky. Jenny, let me come right back to you then. Is O'Toole, is O'Toole's arrangement with the SOCONs going to jeopardize his election chances? And what should he do with Sloan? Uh, well, listen, I think I don't think you can. I, I think they're two separate issues. Derek, you shouldn't. Social conservatives within the conservative party uh, are not Derek Sloan. So those are two separate issues. So um, social conservatives are a vital part of the, the conservative coalition. They always have been. Uh, they were a part of your coalition for for years under your under Paul Martin and uh, and John Cretchen, uh, so I think that's that's completely separate, and I think that they'll continue to play a role, just like uh, as I've said, fiscal conservatives and and uh, Democratic reformers. Uh, as for Derek Sloan, uh, listen, it's Aaron is in a uh, Aaron. It's 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 a tough position for the party and for caucus. You have uh, the uh, the the Chong bill that that has limitations in some way. Uh, in some ways regarding caucus, but like my personal opinion is I, I, I don't think Derek, Derek Sloan should be in caucus. And actually, in fact, he probably never should have been allowed to run in the first place. That's, that's an indictment on, 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 uh, you know, the previous administration. Uh, uh, but that, that would be where, where, where I would stay. But I don't think it's fair to say that social conservatives uh, and, and the issue with Derek Sloan are the same thing. I do. I, I do. I, yeah. I, I think he's. Go I ahead. think he's. I think he's the hammer that pounds the nail. Um, and, and I. I think it's. I, I think that it's tough to be a conservative leader right now because I think the reality is that there's a. Um, people on the fringe that is, let's say ten to fifteen percent of people who are in the COVID manifestation, anti-maskers, anti-vacciners like. Uh, like Sloan, uh, in another day and age, might manifest themselves on, uh, you know, policies against gay marriage, and, or they that's might. Not, that's not true. You're, that's, there is no ideology in terms of anti vascular and, and people that don't want to vaccinate. That that's an absolute ridiculous statement to make. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, and there's a far right, hardcore. Leave me alone. I'm traditional. I don't want things to change, and I'm going to live my own life the way I see fit. And that's a constituency that isn't just 
it just can't be ignored. And it's helped people help. It's disproportionate within the context of a leadership. So people it, take advantage of that really of that constituency to help win leaderships, consolidate support. It was true for Shear. It's true for O'Toole. It's why he's paralyzed over Sloan. And, you know, and, and if you look in Alberta, Jason Kenney's one of the reasons that Jason Kenney is having a difficult time right now is he's got He's not worried about people to the center or the left of him. He's worried about people on the right. And so it makes it awkward for him politically. Well, ultimately, for the conservatives, it's going to come down to Ontario again. Um, that's where it was lost in 2019. Um, and the polls are still showing that the Liberals have some kind of a lead, depending on which poll you see. But everybody says the Liberals have some kind of a lead in Ontario. Jenny, what's the path back in Ontario? What's the path to winning Ontario? Well, it's 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 what you've said. It's said Aaron and his team are going to have to come up with uh, uh, are going to have to come up with uh, policies uh, uh, that that uh, that reach out to the to the 905 to the to the suburban 604 as well. The the uh, you know the the holy grail of of uh, uh, voters, the suburban soccer mom, and, and uh, uh, they're they're going to have to come up with it quick because uh, I think we could probably st start talking about your party next uh, 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 in terms of when there is going to be uh, when. Oh yes, we are, David. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as to when, uh, as to when there's when the next election is going to be, and I don't think it's going to be that far off. And so um, that is what I assume that his team is uh, it, his team is working on. But the the path to victory for any conservative, for any party, really, uh, it has to be one in the uh, is is done in the suburbs. So it's a really interesting question, and it probably has a big impact on the federal election. Who's going to go to the polls first, Ford or Trudeau? Trudeau. Why? Trudeau will go before Ford. Why wouldn't he? I think his only, I think Trudeau regrets not going in the fall. Right. You don't think there's a chance of Ford going this spring? No. He's he's he said repeatedly that that there's no chance that that's going to happen. Yeah. Well. No. No. There's no chance. It's not something that's even discussed. Uh. Uh. That's discussed with any seriousness uh, internally as well. D D Doug isn't going to go to the polls. Uh. The next Ontario election will be will be uh 2022. 20, okay. You agree with that, Scott? I do. I do. I think that, you know, I, I, I just think we live in a time of COVID. Soon we'll live, hopefully, in a time of COVID recovery. I think all of those <laughs> contemporary COVID and COVID recovery are both going to be perilous times politically. So I think if you live in a world of a majority government, you'll probably ride it out and see what happens next. If you live in a time of minority, you run the risk of being forced into an election. And I think that you know, it's more likely, therefore, that Trudeau will have an election before Ford because I don't think anyone's going to want to pull the plug on themselves. I, I think that Trudeau may get forced into an election at the end of the spring or or next fall. Um, you know, for Trudeau, I think the way you want to look at the, at the calendar is, you know, get to summer. If you get to summer, then everything resets. You don't, it's hard to imagine what the world would be like come summer. Like how much have vaccines rolled through? How much are people upset or not upset? How is the economy bounced back or not bounced back? So I think you want to get to the summer and then you evaluate, are you in trouble? Or are you looking better? Um, and you gotta, Scott, you gotta get through March. But Scott, I don't know why you would make the statement that why would anyone want to go in governments? We had two minority governments who pulled the plugs on themselves and they came back with majorities. No, no, no. Like in, in theory, they went, they, there's they lots both, of times you might want to both, go. We had two governments, Higgs and, and, and uh, Horgan, were both minority governments and came back with, with majorities. No, no, of course. But we've talked about this a million times on the podcast. I think there was a before and after date that was somewhere around Labor Day. And I think that you wanted to call an election before Labor Day. And I think after Labor Day, it started to get a lot harder. And so, you know, I'm with you. I think that Trudeau should have called an election before uh, Labor Day and had an election sometime in September, October. I think he probably regrets it. I think he got a bank to majority like Higgs and like Horgan. And now that he didn't, uh, he's looking and saying, I got to I got to I'm going to have to like, you know, play poker to get my way through February and March, and then we'll see what summer brings. Well, maybe one of the reasons why he didn't go in that time frame was that the government was embroiled in a scandal at that point in time around the WE charity. 
um, and uh, that issue was not going well um, for uh, for the government. Um, let's start with, first of all, I haven't heard anything about it for a long time. Is it over? Is that issue now over? Or is there more to come on that? I think there's probably going to be more to come, but the the uh, where people's mindset and where uh, polit- where government is focused on is is different. When when we became an issue, it was uh, it was in in July and August, and uh, uh, COVID was uh, was relatively um, had calmed down, so to speak. Uh, and uh, uh, so it was the the only story. It was the game in town. And uh, now, as as they're you know, we're hitting the second wave uh, around the world, but it, we're hitting the second wave here. I just don't think the appetite is there, uh, even among the opposition to uh, uh, even the opposition to um, uh, to keep it going. But keep in mind, it was hurting them. This is there was a reason they prorogued. Um, uh, because they were starting to uh, no, no, they prorogued. They prorogued to get ready for the throne speech, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, what, is the, what what is the net impact of it? If it's over, if it's gone, what what is the lingering net impact? Well, it, it fits it, it fits into the narrative for the opposition, uh, and 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 the Canadians have uh, opinions about about Trudeau, and generally liberals uh, is that they're in for uh, the friends and family deal. So you have a prime minister who has uh, continually shown bad judgment. He's been dinged by the ethics commissioner, uh, uh, more, d- definitely more than once for taking you know private. Uh, vacations and and uh, and what have you, and now you have a program that was designed by liberals uh, to benefit friends of the Trudeaus, who who uh, uh, you know then in turn uh, paid uh, family members of the Trudeaus. Like we don't have to go through the whole thing, but that's ultimately what it was, and it feeds into a narrative uh, that people uh, that people have about uh, that people have about Trudeau and this government. So Scott, if we if we could both agree that very, very few people are going to walk into a polling booth in 2023, if that's when the election were to be, or even if it were to be this spring, and vote on the basis of the We Charity issue. That's not going to happen. But has it hurt the government nonetheless? Yeah, it, it always, it drops scales from your hide, right? These kinds of things. Um, you know, it just, it, it takes shielding. Um, anybody who's a Star Wars fan knows that when you take incoming fire, the shields start to weaken. If you're a Star Trek fan, at some point, Scotty yells, they're down to 17%, Captain. <laughs> we can't hold her much longer. Jesus Christ, man, get us out of here, right? And so, you know, it, it took some it, t- it it took some scales off. It weakened the shields. Uh, that's 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 what it does. It diminishes the claim that uh, the government has to being something other, uh, not involved in the greasy game of politics, not involved in the day to day management of uh, of partisan matters. And so those things take uh, uh, you know a step. But I think the reason that the that the opposition isn't trying to resuscitate we right now is what Jenny said. Like ultimately. Don't you like I just got to believe that the next election will be decided by the issue that dominates the entire world, which is covid and what comes after covid in terms of whether and I don't want to be too hasty in looking past it, by the way, uh, because I don't know when it uh, gets past us. But, you know, it's going to be will people reward you? because they thought that they did an okay job on keeping things together in COVID, where they condemn you because they don't think you have a plan to get us out of the malaise that COVID created. Will they um, be thirsty for change because they're anxious for something different because COVID just feels like a dark chapter and it's time to just try something else? All of those kinds of things. I think on balance, the government's as okay as it could be right now in broad, very broad terms. But I don't think the next election is going to turn on we. I think that we hurt the government. um, But I think the next election is going to be decided on COVID and all that flows from COVID. Well, and I I think they had an okay day today because uh, uh, the government went out and, of course, announced that they were uh, were going to get an early 249,000 vaccines. And that's great. I'm glad to see. I hope they come. Uh, No one would like to see this government succeed in terms of getting vaccines uh, more than... uh, 
uh, more than me, but uh, to, to, to paraphrase uh, from your Fords. Uh, um, but uh, I think there's still a lot of questions. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of talking up to that uh, we're going to get up to 249,000 uh, doses. It's kind of like I think it was Alan <laughs> Roth back it in. It might be seven. <laughs> it, it, you know, it was, I think it was like, it's, it's, there's the way you phrase things. I think it was Alan Roth when he was asked in the 90s, well, he was justice minister, if he had ever spoke around the medical marijuana debate. And I, or if he had ever smoked pot, and I think his answer was, uh, well, I've never smoked, I can say I've never smoked medical marijuana. And so it's, <laughs> so, it's somewhat in terms of how, how you, how you use the word. And I think that there's, I think there's a lot of questions. A premier, uh, a province, the, the premier, premiers were, were not told about this announcement ahead of time. And, uh, and it's seemingly they have not been, uh, they have not been communicated to from the government in terms of uh, what this per capita means. So when you had the premiers like, Ford and others uh, go out today, uh, they were making their own calculations based on the Prime Minister's uh, press conference. So I think there's a lot of questions here. And uh, as of tomorrow, the UK is going to start having needles in, in arms. And I think that this is going to be a huge, huge challenge, uh, a very huge challenge with this government because they're still not, he, he, he got through today, um, but now he's going to have to, de to, to, uh, to, to deliver. So every two weeks, a CN train pulls out of New Richmond, Quebec, or Matan, or Trois-Rivières, headed for Chicago and then onward to Texas. It's often a long train, as much as a mile and a half from tip to tip. Sometimes it's a tower train, loaded with the superstructures of those giant hypnotic modern windmills that loom up at you so suddenly when you're driving past a wind farm. And sometimes it's a blade train, carrying the giant blades you see turning in the wind from a distance. Yes, giant. Those blades are 120 feet long. That's 36 meters. All manufactured in Quebec, which not only has its own wind farm industry, it produces turbines so coveted that they're in demand down in Texas, the state that produces more wind power than any other. Since 2016, CN has moved more than 8,500 wind turbine components from factories in Quebec to wind farms along the CN network, which runs from coast to coast and down the Mississippi to the Gulf. Wind turbines and CN fit very nicely indeed. There's a growing global demand for clean, green energy. Green may well power the post-pandemic recovery, and you don't get much greener than wind power. Yes, trains still consume fossil fuels, but they consume proportionately far less than trucks or cars or aircraft. We've said it here before. One train can take hundreds of trucks off our highways. Trains are not only the main arteries and veins of our economy, they are utterly crucial in any sensible green energy plan. It's becoming apparent that when the pandemic ends, we will be entering a new era, and CN's locomotives will be powering the journey, as they have been for more than 100 years. Scott, COVID gave Justin Trudeau a real fresh lease on life um, and authority um, in the spring when it came about. I think the, those early months where he was doing those daily briefings were high water points for him in his prime ministership, but also every premier had soaring approval ratings back in that period of time. Some are holding on to good approval ratings more than others. What is the secret to public approval in the COVID era? Well, I think it's two things, and some have proven to be good at one, but not necessarily the second, um, and some the jury's out. So I think I think in March, I, this is going to sound ridiculous, but I don't think it was that hard to figure out how to be a good leader in March. I think in March you go, we are confronted by an external crisis. It's a virus. It's coming at us as a society and as a people. We have to come together. We have to um, create a priority around combating that. And we got to put uh, our collective interests first. And lots and lots and lots of people did that on all sorts of political divides and all sorts of countries. And it was unless you were like a dummy like Trump who tried to pretend that it didn't exist and insist that you're going to, you know, whatever, drink uh, Clorox and it would make you better. They're the only people who failed. Um, but now, and, and we've talked about this, this goes back to our discussion about when it was the right time to call in the election. I think sometime around the end of summer when the second wave began to present itself as was told and predicted but once it actually started to come into force people said okay that's not enough now i need to scrutinize 
what judgments you made, what decisions you made, why isn't tracing in place, why isn't why aren't those uh, rapid tests here? What's going on in terms of vaccines? Um, is the rent relief program working? Uh, are you telling the LCBO they can deliver booze and undermining uh, businesses that are already flat in their back? Like all those kind of micro decisions, some are not micro, some are macro, but big deals, not small deals. I think all those decisions now people are scrutinizing and holding governments to account. So I think for a while, accountability on small decisions was suspended but now it's not and that makes it tough to be a political leader now well i think accountability on big decisions in the spring uh, uh was ignored uh for the most part and i think the reason was yeah. people were scared uh people were scared uh they a lot there was a record level of of unemployment and no one really knew what we were navigating people were willing to give politicians and officials uh the benefit of the doubt because no one had a clue and that 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 was for everyone around the world. But we are kind of 10 months into this now. And to your point, Scott, you said, you know, the second wave started in September and uh, um, everyone knew it was coming. Seemingly everyone knew, but a lot of political leaders within this uh, country did nothing about it during the uh, during the summer months. Trudeau was more captivated with uh, making sure that, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the we scandal went away and uh, uh, more st more uh, liberal programs didn't get exposed for, uh, you know, the devil is in the details. And that's why we find ourselves where we are in, in vaccines. And if you look, uh, for example, here at tr in Track and Trace, it's all levels of government. And I've been critical of, of, of provincial governments and federal governments and, and municipal governments here. There was uh, uh, here in Toronto, there was a uh, report out that basically 71 percent of uh, Toronto COVID cases, which is higher than anywhere else right now uh, in the province, uh, there's no track or trace for it. So they don't actually know where it's coming from. And I think that people, as they, uh, uh, you know, navigate around the term, I really fucking hate the new normal, um, uh, they're not going to let politicians uh, <laughs> off uh, with just basically the, the useless platitudes that we're all, we're all in this together because seemingly we're not. Why aren't we all in it together? Well, because there seems to be like you have politicians that go out every day and tell everyone else to stay at home, uh, but but they're going into work. H how many other people are around uh, uh, that 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 are working with them? It, it, it's a practical point of view. You have people, um, you know, th th there are studies out that show the suicide rates or the depression rates are very high. So you have politicians that are going out going. Uh, don't go outside your house. Uh, we're going to shut down stores. We're going to shut down restaurants. And I just don't think it's sustainable. It's not sustainable for people's mental health. And it's definitely not sustainable. Uh, it's not sustainable for the government. And I think you're going to see uh, the polls start to uh, reflect that. We're seeing it now among among premiers uh, in terms of their approval rating and Trudeau's that are starting to uh, go down from what their peak, um, uh, their peak height is. And I think that at the end of the day for these elections, we're going to find out uh, what works better. Is it going to be... Uh, uh, the the head or the heart, and so is it. You know, John Horgan uh, showed that it was the head. He 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 led very much like that. Trudeau and Doug were more on the the heart, the platitudes, uh, and we'll see how uh, they uh, uh, how it works for them in the next election. You know, I don't think it's about the all in this together thing. I think that lots of politicians who sound that common note and say, "Look, we gotta." We have to hang in there and try to support one another. I think that people will nod their head to that. I think that 70-30 will still be the break in terms of people saying, I got to be more careful rather than less careful, especially if cases are, you know, blowing up all over the place. So I don't think it's that people will condemn that. I think what will happen is, and that didn't happen in the Mar in March and in the spring, is that people will say, I'm also, though, going to uh, um, attach to that hard questions about what you have done and haven't done. Uh, that got us here or that will hopefully get us out of here. And that's that's where I think it's it's more difficult. I don't think people are going to say, you know what, I'm going to go. Um, I'm sick and tired of government telling me I can't go to a bar and I want to go lick, uh, you know, a stranger. I think what's happening is that people are going to say, why isn't there tracing? Why isn't that adequate? Why didn't that happen? Um, and I think, you know, they, it's going to get ugly. Like we're in for a long freaking winter, man. And I... I I think it's a, a perilous time for governments at all levels, but I think probably more perilous for governments at the provincial level because there'll be such an emphasis on execution. I'd like to welcome a new sponsor to the pod today, Tech Resources Limited. Founded and headquartered in Canada, Tech has been helping build communities and the economy for over 100 years. They're committed to responsibly providing the metals and minerals 
needed for a low carbon future and for building a better quality of life for people around the world. Sustainability is at the core of everything tech does. That includes working closely with local communities and Indigenous peoples to advance reconciliation, create growth and opportunity, and ensure the benefits of mining are shared. Tech is setting ambitious goals to help build on their track record of responsible development, including setting the goal to be carbon neutral across their operations by 2050. Learn how they plan to achieve this and other important initiatives at tech.com backslash sustainability. That's T-E-C-K dot com slash sustainability. So I want to just bring up Jason Kenney and, and not to discuss the policies of the Kenney government, but to say this. Uh, there appears to my eye to be a monolithic consensus in the media about how to handle COVID. And that that is to uh, take every safety precaution possible. Every decision by a government that is not directed at safety comes under a shitload of scrutiny. Um, if you are outside that media consensus, how do you operate? If you're, uh, if you, what you want to pursue is a policy that's outside of a monolithic media consensus, how do you do that? What do you mean? Like how Jason's uh, handling COVID? Well, I don't, again, I don't want to talk about how he's handling COVID. I want to talk about the fact that he's getting hammered, at least by national media, every day, because they don't agree with what he's doing. Well, they I mean, have a different perspective. But what's the difference between how BC, and Alberta, BC and Alberta's approaches? It seems to be every, this is the problem. It's, it's the, the end, John Horgan is an inconvenient truth for uh, people that want to shit on conservative premiers because Horgan and Kenny have had very similar policies uh, throughout the, uh, uh, throughout this, this uh, uh, pandemic. They have, uh, they have been resistant to lockdown measures like what we're stuck here in the, the prison that is uh, Toronto. Um, I, it was only two weeks ago that BC actually uh, enacted a mask um, uh, a mask uh, ruling, David. You and I were on uh, TV while it, uh, while it happened. So I'm, I don't really understand. I'd, I'd actually say those to the, to the media people then uh, that are that, that this general consensus uh, is what is Jason Kenney doing different than what John Horgan is doing? Where does that get you, though? I mean, in all honesty, where does that argument get you? That that's falls into the yeah, but category of argumentation. And ultimately, here's the truth. 46% um, of people... Uh, disapprove of what Kenny's doing, and and uh, over sixty percent approve of what Trudeau is doing. So, and that's in Alberta. That's in Alberta. Okay, and so Kenny is running behind in his own constituency, and he's he's got a challenge on his hands. So, to David's issue, I think the problem for Kenny is that he uh, he's leaving the impression that he is not as seized with this issue as people expect him to be. And so media will condemn him, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly. But ultimately, it doesn't matter what John Horgan's doing or what Justin Trudeau is doing. Like in Alberta, the measuring stick is what Albertans think of how Jason Kenney's doing it. And he's failing his own test. And, and I think one of the problems, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, which is that Jason Kenney's in an awkward spot. You know, he's, he's worried about the 15 to 20 percent of people who are protesting outside of the legislature right now with anti-mask things. And it's a large and forceful number that used to be within his voter coalition. And he's worried that they won't necessarily return to his voter coalition. So he's got to figure out a way that he does the right thing as the premier, that he protects public health, that he manages his voter coalition, and that he doesn't create some kind of fractioning of the right. And that's that's tough politically. I think that's super tough for him. And throw in there that he's a true believer. He believes in smaller government. He believes in individual choice. He believes in freedom and all this stuff. And uh, so it makes it goddamn hard for him. Yeah, freedom and all that's the terrible shit. <laughs> like that. Yeah, I hate I hate all that horse shit talk. You know, like I that's hate all that tea party. Like let's have the freedom. Down. Let's have the freedom to infect one another. I, I think that's completely unfair. Let's also talk about a factor that none of the other provinces had was uh, that Alberta's economy was taking a real hit uh, uh, pre-COVID uh, from uh, pipelines to blockades. 
the Alberta economy was uh, uh, was suffering uh, there, which is which is on the front, which is in the mindset of people from Alberta as as uh, as as well. And so Jason has had the. Uh, he has had the task of having to balance not just people's health concerns, but also also the economic concerns, because uh, the rest of the country better hope that uh, I, I, you know Alberta gets through this in terms of economically, uh, because they have been a uh, steady steady source of sending uh, money east uh, for several for several years. So in terms of the polls, David, I think what you were getting at is is where Jason's levels in the polls were. Let's be honest, though, he never had the COVID bump that some of the other premiers had. He never had the bump that Trudeau had or that uh, uh, or that um, Doug has had uh, that Legault has. And by the way, still has. He still remains, I think, uh, the number one uh, number one listed premier. So I think it's it's I don't think it's fair to say his he's taking a drubbing. I think that he's been a more it's been more static for him uh, for, for for the whole pandemic. And there's two and a half years. There's a lot can happen. A uh, lot can happen in two and a half years before his election. Well, he's definitely facing a hostile media on this subject. But the the you mentioned the economy and Jenny, this is a thing that you and I have been talking about on the pod for a long time. Tiff Macklem, the governor of the Bank of Canada was at the finance committee a week or so ago. And he said there's 600,000 people unemployed still from COVID that were laid off because of COVID. And they do not expect that those people will entirely be reintegrated into the workforce for several years, which was their justification for keeping quantitative easing going because they did not expect the economy to be able to absorb the excess labor capacity for several years. Yeah. So that is something that hasn't even entered really the COVID political equation yet because there's been so much government support poured out to people who've been unemployed. I'm not saying it's excessive, but it's more than normal. That's for sure. And they're not having to fight their way through an employment ins insurance system that doesn't recognize them or pays them a pittance or anything like that. So far more than would normally be the case, these people have been shielded from the impact and the economy has been shielded from the impact of what happened to those people. So presumably, eventually, unless we have a new enriched permanent employment insurance program, presumably at some point the government's going to start withdrawing some of that support. Do they wait until after? Uh, do they wait to change the program until after we're back at full employment? Or when does this, do you think, when does the economic impact of COVID really start to kick in? Because I've always been of the view that that was going to be the treacherous time for governments. I agree. I think the, the it, it absolutely is the treacherous time for governments. I think it if if we hadn't been in a second wave and the liberals had not extended things like the the wage subsidy and and re the reprogrammed rent subsidy, uh, we'd probably be there already. And even Tr Trudeau himself has mused that these that these programs cannot last. The average household income has actually gone up uh, 11 percent uh, uh, over this year from last year uh, because their people aren't doing as much because uh, in some cases their income is bolstered uh, by the government uh, by government programs. And that's when it's it's going to be that's when it's going to be a huge hit and I think um, the ramifications that um, that that are going to hit the Canadian economy are going to be very very uh, it, it, they're going to be it, it's going to be uh, it's going to be hard for it, it for the governments to uh, uh, to not um, uh, to not feel the heat on it and I think that's going to be part of the calculation the liberals are going to want uh, to have an election sooner rather than later Scott what do you think I think you go gradual I mean, I just don't, I don't really, I don't understand the breathlessness that attaches itself to this discussion. We are in a completely unprecedented, uh, supernatural universe all of a sudden, right? We're in a world where every government is, is spending, and you can make the argument that statistically our government is spending more to sustain household incomes, but every government in the world is spending in a way that it hasn't since the Second World War. There's paying to sustain businesses, paying to sustain uh, individuals, and they're doing it because the alternative is worse. And so to me, um, like, it's not, it's not rocket science. Uh, what's going to happen is once you get to a, a, a place where the economy can start to open up again, 
gradually withdraw the supports, gradually reform the supports. They'll probably end up being more generous than they were when we started all of this. We'll probably have learned that qualifying for them ought to be less onerous. We'll probably feel like um, the base level of them should be higher. Um, but I think uh, my bet is the governments that will suffer most will be the governments that move too rapidly to withdraw as compared to those that say, I'm just going to keep it here for a bit. And, you know, you say, well, how can we afford it? Well, how? Everyone's in the same boat. It's not 1995 when we were confronted with a debt to GDP ratio that was out of whack with everybody else in the OECD. Everybody in the OECD is going to have an out of whack debt to GDP ratio. And so some will come down a little more rapidly. Some will come down a little less rapidly. I'm not even sure that that will be the measuring stick as to which are the most successful economies. So I, I just, I, to my mind, like, it's very complicated territory, obviously, but I think in some ways it's simple. Go gradual. Uh, and, and, and beware those who think, well, you know, the most important thing is to start withdrawing this stuff. Let's start kicking the struts out as fast and as hard as possible. I think those people will find themselves in opposition. Okay, well, government programs or not, eventually this government is going to actually have to show a, a path back to some form of uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal restraint and start paying uh, uh, in terms of how they're going to pay for these programs. And there's one of two ways. You, de you decrease spending in certain areas or you raise taxes. And this is something the government, and if I was, uh, if I was any of the opposition parties, you're going to be, and you're probably coming from, it, from different areas, whether you're the NDP or whether you're the, uh, the Tories, uh, is the, this government is going to have to say, okay, like, you can't just continue to print money. So this government is going to have to, to, to make, to, to cut programs or they're going to have to raise taxes. And, and based on Freeland's very bizarre statement from, uh, uh, from the weekend or, or last week, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, for all of you people out there that have some savings in the bank, uh, uh, be very afraid because it seems like uh, she was saying, don't make, you know, think about what you're going to do. Don't make me come for your bank accounts. Well, I, I, I go back to it. I don't think I, I don't buy that. And I think that it is political poison that people will be drinking from their own cup. The political party that says there's only two ways to go. We got to raise taxes or or cut spending and we better talk about it right now and do it right now. I think that is a recipe to get pounded. I think it's probably a, an economic failure. It's for sure going to be a political failure. And my argument is smear the word gradual over everything you do as a government, and I bet that people will nod their head. We are going to move through this thing gradually. We're gonna remove those protections gradually. We're gonna figure this out sensibly. We're gonna go step by step. We're not gonna hastily say, my God, it's time to cut spending and raise taxes. That would be a big mistake. Well, I'm sure that every government that ever lost an election over a recession, whether it be the liberals in the early 80s <clears throat> or the conservatives in the early 90s wishes that they had thought of paying everybody who was unemployed through the recession more money than they had been making before um, as a way of uh, blunting the blow. Because <laughs> normally these kinds of unemployment rates are political death. Right? Yeah. So... so you guys, I think we're getting near the end of our round. And I, since it's a year in review, I wanted to have a, a short snapper section for us okay. where we make some calls on what happened over the course of the last year. So let's start with this. What was the best Canadian political strategy of the year? Jenny. John Horgan. John Horgan. John Horgan by, handled, by going how, early, breaking. How, yeah. how, how, we ha how we handled covid he got. He had, of course, Dr. Bonnie Henry helped out on that on that uh, on that front. Uh, he uh, he took the chance, uh, had the balls to call an election, and uh, it it benefited him massively. Scott, who's yours? Serb. What's your best political strategy of the year? Serb. You can't come up with a better political strategy. Serb. Uh, Insulated people from the dislocation and economic impacts of what was ha what has actually been a monster recession, but not that many people feel it, or they don't feel as sharp as they should have. And serve was the right public policy response. Um, and and the government didn't 
did move adroitly on wage subsidy and a couple of other things, but it did move adroitly on CERB. I think CERB is the huge political win, best political strategy, best public policy strategy of the year. And I think others are going to be looking at it with envy for years to come. Well, those are both good answers. I'm going to throw O'Toole into the mix because he was widely discounted at the beginning of the race. He didn't get any of the kind of national media attention that allows you to make that kind of ground up. And he totally reinvented his image internally as a true blue conservative. And many in the halls of the salons of power in Ottawa and Toronto mocked him because that's not who he was. And what a what a redneck political strategy that is anyways. But it worked for him. And he's the leader of the Conservative Party. And he would be a betting favorite to be prime minister at some point in his life. So worked out for him. It's a good move. Um, what is the worst gaffe of the year in Canadian politics? Scott. The double W. The double W that Bill Morneau pulled off this year. The first one was blowing the wage subsidy. Can you imagine that there was a period in time in the face of COVID when it broke that he said, we're going to subsidize wage earners to the tune of 10% up to, I actually don't remember it, a limit of, I don't know, $90 or something. It was ridiculous. Like, it was gruesome. That was the first W. The second W was we showing up at the committee hearing and saying, I just want to let you know before we talk, I'm happy to answer your questions, and I know they're going to be tough. But I just stroked a check for $41,000 because it turned out that when I um, – Check my calendar. I hadn't paid entirely for all my flights and meals and uh, comforter or whatever the hell. So the W W the double W of wage subsidy and we is why Bill Morneau is no longer the finance minister. And I don't know that you could come up with a bigger boner than that. It was just something to watch. Well, I, I think with we, you can't fully blame that with Morneau. He's kind of a bit of a supporting actor there. Uh, to say that he was responsible for that is, is a bit revisionist, uh, uh, because obviously that, that program would never have uh, gone through cabinet or been devised uh, if no one from the center had uh, anything to do with it, having worked in, in, uh, uh, in government. So I agree. I think that uh, I think that uh, I agree with, uh, with Scott on his on uh, the one uh, the one W. Um, uh, but I uh, disagree that it's uh, fully Morneau's fault. I think there's a lot of uh, it idiotic things that, that Morneau has done, but I think that that gaffe uh, rests with um, uh, with um, uh, the tr Trudeau and uh, his buddy, uh, Craig and Mark Kielberger. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you, Scott, that I think the worst gaffe of the year was the Morneau expenses. Um, uh, waking up one morning and not only realizing that he owed forty thousand dollars, but cutting a check for forty thousand um, dollars, and <laughs> so I think that is the worst gap of the year. But you took it, so I'm going to go back, and I think I'm creeping back into 2019, but it's relevant to 2020. I'll throw into the mix McKay and stinking albatross, referring to the SoCons. It may well be that he was defeated that day. When he said that. Couldn't have helped. Um, who is the emerging star in Canadian politics? Well, I'm Jenny. actually going to go. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to be a little bit different on this uh, on this question. We have always had uh, uh, some good, strong front bench uh, support uh, in our party. You have Candace Bergen and Michelle Rempel still there. Ronna Ambrose was our, uh, our interim leader, but what I'm seeing now is not just at the at the political level. Uh, cons there's a there's an, a, a, a renewal. More conservative women uh, are, are being uh, are kind of being thrust into uh, into politics or choosing politics. Leslie Lewis showed us that uh, during the uh, the leadership race. She was essentially an unknown, not unknown, not just an unknown in Canada, an unknown within our party, and uh, and ended up. You know, raising 1.4 million dollars and uh, and getting uh, you know 20 percent of the vote on the first ballot, 30 percent of the vote on on uh, on the second ballot, and she's going to be running and and uh, in a riding where I think that we'll we obviously will keep it's a class of 04. Diane Finley um, uh, uh, isn't uh, isn't running again, but you also have people um, uh, you know my friend uh, my very good friend Melissa Lanceman, who's a CJPAC fellow 
um, uh, from uh, not too many years ago. Uh, she's running for a nomination in, uh, uh, in Thornhill. Uh, you also have uh, another former colleague that I have, uh, Catherine Lubier, is what it, you call the Delegate General uh, for Quebec in New York City. And she was instrumental in terms of fighting back uh, on the Trump administration uh, on aluminum tariffs, uh, as well as inking deals with, um, with Quebec Hydro and uh, New York, as well as other uh, Mideastern uh, states. So I'm happy about the future of our party and the women that are, are um, uh, and the women that are coming up throughout it. All right, Scott, who's your rising star? I don't have the same answer as Jenny. Um, mine would be enemy Paul. Um, I, I, I don't really know very much about enemy Paul, if I want to be entirely honest. But um, I think she's got game. I think the new leader of the Green Party has game. I think that she's exciting. I think that she's going to have a whack of appeal, uh, not just in terms of Greens, which Liz did, but I think she's going to have a lot of appeal on the center left. I think that's going to be a lot of trouble in the immediate term um, for the NDP. Could be trouble for the Liberals uh, eventually. And I just think, you know, it, it may all fritter. We've been talking about Green Party leaders provincially and federally and Green Party vote in between elections that may manifest itself forever and a day. But if I was to pinpoint someone right now that's exciting and you say attach the word rocket who is rising to someone i think it's enemy paul i think you gotta watch her she, she's gotta pick a seat though that's not toronto center to run in because you can't be a, a rocket or a star if, if you don't win your uh win your election and and uh, uh i just think that toronto center is uh, uh it's one of the safest liberal seats in the uh, uh in the country yeah she looks like she's got some star quality, though. I am going to be watching her uh, carefully, I as I assume, as I assume, Jugmeet Singh is. Um, so, <laughs> uh, those are both those are both really good answers. I'm going to go with the tried and true Christia Freeland. Uh, she's been a rising star for a long time, but she's now starting to hit apex, and she's either going to be it or not be it. She's gonna she's gonna have a baptism of fire here with a with a budget and managing the next couple of years in the economy. And she's either going to uh, be defeated by it or she's going to emerge from it as the likely next leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. So she's at the top of her apex right now, and I'm going to be interested to see how she handles it. We have only a minute left, so let's oh. be really quick. Who's the falling star in Canadian politics right now? Oh, Scott. I think Morneau got that. Sorry. Who? Morneau or Julie Payette close second yeah well okay. i think both those stars have fallen i think the falling star is jason kenny i think there's a real possibility to get beat in the next election by rachel notley and what a hell of a thing that'd be well i think my answer to that question is patty haidu she's the minister of health she has really been pretty invisible in terms of leadership to the country through this when she's popped her head up, it's not gone terribly well. Um, uh, it's a pretty important position to have kind of punted through this COVID period. And I, I suspect she's not up for a promotion uh, when the cabinet gets shuffled next time. I've got some questions here. Uh, one of them says, Will the current political leaders be able to survive the post-COVID reviews, including the lack of vaccine production, the vaccine rollout, issues with the airline industry and other industries that will inevitably take place? In retrospect, the narrative may be rather brutal. We've covered some of this territory, but who do you think doesn't make it out of this alive? Well, I don't think I don't think we know yet, I, but I do think that uh, if... Uh, uh, as I said before, the the benefit of the doubt that people are giving uh, political leaders right now is starting to uh, is starting to uh, wane. And I think that the longer that this this goes on, the more it's it's going to be. We're talking about elections. You know, we talked about Ontario and uh, uh, Alberta. Their elections are are you know less just less shy of two and just over two, uh, respectively. Who would have thought we would be in the position we are now? So who knows what's going to happen in the next bit? But I think that if if people are sitting on election day and uh, they're, they, we are behind the world in uh, vaccinations and uh, the unemployment is uh, in double digits and uh, 
um, I think that it's going to be very hard for governments at all levels to get reelected. Me too. Scott, what do you think? I think all incumbents are going to be in trouble. I think it's going to be tough. I think the um, I, I, I think the most important thing to recognize, and this is where I think this is my theory of get the big things right. And I think that the federal government and Trudeau has sort of gotten the big thing right. I, I think governments that don't say we got to do whatever we got to do are going to be in trouble. Uh, I think the governments that cling to uh, the rules uh, that existed prior to, say, March 15th, 2020, uh, may find themselves really, really tested because I just don't think those rules exist anymore. Uh, and when we say things like, well, we can't afford that or we couldn't possibly do that, I just don't think that that's I don't think that's right. Um, and so governments that say we're going to do what we got to are going to be the ones that uh, get through this. In terms of Trudeau doing things right, we will promise that uh, we'll go back and, uh, and, and discuss that at the end of Q1 and see how many Canadians have been vaccinated as uh, compared to the rest of the world. Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the risk of quoting Donald Rumsfeld and saying that there are known unknowns and unknown unknowns, and the future is really, in this case, impossible to decipher, and the proof is going to be in the pudding. So I'm just going to land with both of you that all incumbents are going to be in a lot of trouble if they have to face the people in the next year and a half or so, because the combination of COVID fatigue, perhaps COVID anger, and economic distress is going to be pretty difficult, uh, pretty difficult to manage. Uh, we have another question here, which says, let's talk speech writing. Any unforgettable stories from your war chests? Who was the best principal you ever wrote for? Can even the most brilliantly crafted speech go to waste on a bad speaker? And how do you overcome the pain of that? I'll let Scott start with that. Uh, yeah, well, let me start with, I think it was a middle question in there somewhere. I think there was a question of, can a great speech go to worst on a bad, uh, go to waste on a bad speaker? And the answer to that is you freaking better yeah. believe it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> like a great speaker can make a terrible speech uh, sing and a bad speaker can't make a great speech sing. Like it's just that um, hard. You can make it confident for somebody with a good structured speech um, if they're a bad speaker, but not much. You know, my my best and worst stories, I mean, I, I this is, you know, David and I get accused of sort of, you know, going back to the same well over and over and over again, but, um, <laughs> you know, Paul Barton was so obsessed with speeches. Like, I mean, he was so obsessed with speeches. So you got the combination of Paul's absolute fixation on the process of speech writing, um, uh, the detail of speech writing, his obsession with structure and speeches, vocabulary, how things could be done, how they couldn't done. You combine all of that with the fact that I was in the sort of ascent of my professional life. That's when I was, those are my formative years. And I'm like, I'm dealing with this guy who I've never had a tougher taskmaster ever since then in my entire life, never had to write a speech for anybody who was as tough as Paul Martin. So sometimes we would scream the F word at each other as loud as we could, and we'd end up in exasperation. But if I want to be honest, as much as he was impossible and drove me around the bend and made me want to pound the wall and drink that entire bottle until it was empty, he made me a better speechwriter because he forced me to think about structure. He forced me to think about brevity forced me to think about economy um so you know uh my best and worst best was paul martin because he forced me to do all those things worst was paul martin because uh he could be impossible and punishing <laughs> and miserable <laughs> well, well Jenny, I was, you got a speech writing story i i i wasn't a speech writer um i i i uh it was a job uh, when I worked for the Prime Minister uh, that I pitied uh, who had that uh, for the same reasons that Scott was talking. At the end of the day, the Prime Minister is a uh, perfectionist and, and uh, uh, at the end of the day, the final, the final pen uh, was his. But uh, I, uh, there, were, there were moments that I felt terrible for anyone that was uh, doing the draft. And, and it was the dreaded, you know, we'd have our morning meeting and it would be the dreaded at the end going, uh, does everyone want to stay around and go through the speech? And and you knew that the prime minister was not happy. And I always, without fail, I got something. I, I got to go. But you guys, you guys have fun. 
You know, I'm just going to add. I I'm, know we are out of time, David, but I'm just going to say this one thing. Once in the late 90s, we were going up to the Kuchiching Institute. They have an annual conference and they give a keynote speech. Paul was asked to give the keynote speech as finance minister. And as we were driving up there in the van, I'm in the back. He's in the passenger seat and he beats me. He beats me like a rented mule about the speech that I've written. And then he falls asleep. And as he's sleeping, he's kind of drowsing and he's doing this. And he's running, and then he'd go, how could you do that? How could you do that? <laughs> he's, he's asleep, and he's dreaming, and he's muttering, how could you do that? And he wakes up, and he looks at me, and he goes, fuck, how could you do that? Right? And that was, <laughs> that's, that's what it was. But you know what? That speech was great, actually, at the end of the day, and probably because he screamed at me so much. Yeah, my, my, I think my favorite speech story, I've never been a writer, but I've been involved in the construction of some of them. And I remember in 2014, when we were really struggling to pull together uh, for a number of months, really struggling to pull together our message for Kathleen Wynne to take into the 2014 election. And we had a lot of things from the past to juggle. And we had, uh, uh, you know, we had a, a landscape where Horvath seemed to have a little bit going. And we were trying to figure out how to maneuver our way through that. I remember working, Scott Festchuk helped with that speech. And... There was a lot of us, you know, you were involved. A lot of us were working really hard on that. And by the time she delivered it at the at the annual convention, and I heard it, I knew that that was the speech that could win us the election, that we'd, we'd actually landed on it. And I remember Bob Shirelli, as he left the convention, coming over and saying, I can sell that. So that was a good feeling. We got that. one last question, and it's going to be really quick. Scott. Can you highlight a local restaurant or small business to support in this difficult time? <laughs> I think I can wing come joint. up with one. There's a little place called the Bistrot Avenue that has wings and ribs, uh, frequently employs many of my sons in the kitchen and the uh, takeout staff, <laughs> and always seems to have a cool cooler full of beer for moi. So go to the Bistrot Avenue. I second that. I second that if you're in Toronto, but if you happen to be in the Gatineau's, find your way to Baltimore, Quebec, and go to McClellan's Home Hardware, J.B. McClelland and Sons. It's the best store you'll ever find. They sell anything you could possibly need. If, you don't, if they don't have it, they'll get it for you. And like every store during COVID, they're struggling. So there, they don't have wings, though. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Scott and Jenny, again for bringing everything that they bring to these conversations. I love them so much. Thank you to the CJ Pack people for inviting us and hosting such a wonderful event last night. We were very, very pleased to be part of it. We'll be back next week with our regular two-parter. Look forward to seeing you then. Burly, burly.